welcome to Maddie's Mental Health Podcast, aiming to spread awareness on mental health by sharing the real life stories of those who've experienced it firsthand. So we know each other a little bit. A little bit, yeah. yeah we work together. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. But sometimes, uh, I mean, every day. Every day, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've had some good conversations, and uh, you told me a little bit about your story. Um, so do you want to jump right into it and um, maybe talk about it some more? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm diagnosed bipolar 2, um, which is, and I was listening to Taylor's podcast the other day, and it's it's similar except um, her mania would be like a big episode of mania, and that's kind of like the definition of her um, her bipolar, whereas mine is kind of, it's it's not as intense mania, but it's kind of more often. Like I'll have it every once in every once in a while. I'll just get manic, and I know Taylor said when she's manic, she feels like she's a genius, mm-hmm. which is I understand that completely. But I I more think that I'm like invincible. Like I'll get to a point where I think like nothing can hurt me, and I'll, like I'll never die, and I can do anything, and nothing's gonna hurt me, kind of thing. Wow. Yeah, and then I'll just drop into the depression state and feel worthless. So it's like kind of it's it's two extremes kind of thing. Right. Um, so, uh, originally like I was, when I was younger, I was diagnosed with, um, depression and anxiety. And then eventually they figured out kind of the mania part of it. And, uh, I started getting treatment for it. I've been in unit nine a few times, um, in and out a couple times. I was in Hillsborough hospital for a little bit, which was very helpful actually. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a big, big step in my recovery for sure. Um, And then with the mania kind of started the whole addiction, like, uh, unhealthy coping skills, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you think that you're invincible, then (laughs) you think you can pretty much do anything. Nothing's going to hurt you. So, um, and then when I was in the depression stage, it was kind of to numb my emotions sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I experienced some trauma, um, back when I was 19, 20. And that's kind of when the addiction took over to a big part of it. Um, just because I wanted to kind of numb everything. and I didn't want to have to like feel all those feelings that I was feeling at the time. So I turned to drugs and alcohol. And uh, that was a big part of my life for like a few years. That's pretty much all I did. Um, and yeah, like I did, you know, some stuff that I regret for for money for drugs and alcohol and stuff like that so then i'd have that regret and then i'd want to numb that regret and i'd do it all over again and then end up doing something else that i regretted and it was just kind of a vicious circle right yeah well um so you said you were diagnosed with depression and anxiety like at a young age young yeah i was pretty young I want to say like junior high. Junior high? Yeah. So what were the symptoms like um, in junior high? And was that the first time you kind of, was that like around the time when it all started with junior high? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I think it's something that I've kind of always been struggling with, but it came, it became more noticeable then. Um, And now thinking back, uh, there's a lot of things that happened when I was younger that I didn't really realize how much it was linked to my mental health, you know, just like little things that I think back of now and that I've almost raced from my memory. Mm -hmm. Um, I just kind of put it in a box and put it away. And, um, but now that I'm more open to my mental illness and I, I understand it a little bit more and I've spoken with psychologists and stuff, they have, we've kind of linked it. So I think it is something that I've always struggled with. I just think that that's when it really became noticeable and started affecting me a lot was in junior high yeah so um so it started in junior high Mm -hmm. and um continues through high school yeah so when i was in grade 10 was the first time i was admitted to was in grade 10 or 11 anyway that i was admitted to unit 9 for a big issue of mine was self-harm and that was what was really noticeable to my parents and my friends and they knew that i wasn't safe because i was self-harming um, which is just another unhealthy coping mechanism that mm-hmm. I had. Um, 
yeah, and it, it got pretty bad. So that's when I uh, first went to the hospital and first started getting a couple different diagnoses, but eventually it came to bipolar. So, um, self-harm, um, as a coping mechanism, is it like kind of like a temporary relief? Yeah, it's one of those things that, I mean, a lot of people ask me about it, and it's one of those things that's so hard to explain unless you yeah, experience imagine, it. Yeah, imagine, yeah. But, um, I don't know, I, I think that it's it's a way to relieve your pain in a, in a different way. Like, you feel pain on the inside, and then to be able to to see it, um, and to be like, okay, this is real pain, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind, of, kind of hard to recognize, like, what's in your head, and yeah. what's, like, you know, so it's like, it's almost, I don't know, it's a relief in that sense, I yeah. guess. Um, and yeah. in the time, it's almost wow. like, yeah. It's almost like dissociating. Like I don't even really realize that I'm doing it until mm-hmm. afterwards. Like yeah. it's something that I would just automatically do. And it's almost like I was watching myself do it, not really doing it. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards I would regret it. And yeah. Wow. That, that's so deep. What you said that, um, like you can actually see your pain mm-hmm. and it's a relief. Mm-hmm. I never thought of it that way. That's yeah. very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the first time you were in Unit 9. You mm-hmm. said that was around 10th grade. Yeah. Um, so then um, was substances like, or uh, was that ever a problem for you? You said that you had a trauma around 19, 20. Yeah, so I never really had a huge issue with substances. I was always very, like, I have a very addictive personality. Right. right. So like when I did something I did it hard. Like yeah. I went I went for it, yeah. you know. Yeah. But um yeah, so like, you know, I partied, I did I did my fair share of things that I shouldn't have done when I was younger. But yeah. um it was more when I experienced some trauma um when I was nineteen that it became like a thing, you know, like mm-hmm. it was something that I always relied on. Yeah. And it was my, you know, I wasn't self-harming at that point, but I was, I was self-harming really when you think about it in a, yeah. dif- in a different way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it became, it's, it's crazy to even think that I, I was like that, but it was my whole life yeah. was just like using drugs, finding drugs, making money to be able to buy drugs and alcohol and just, it was constant all the time. That's all I did. Um, so the trauma that happened is that it's totally okay if it's something you don't want to talk about? Yeah, no, I'm okay with um, it. I was sexually assaulted on uh, New Year's Eve by two men. Um, and what happened was I went to the police afterwards, and they basically couldn't prove anything because the guys had that they told they talked to the guys, and the guys had basically said that everything I said was true except for that it was consensual. They said that it it all happened, but I said yes, basically, which is not true. And mm-hmm. but um, uh, yeah, and it was it was really hard. Um, the next few days was I didn't really tell anyone. I didn't really talk about it. I told a close friend at one point. Uh, she's the one that actually took me to the police station. Um, and I know my parents just saw me go downhill really quick, mm-hmm. and they knew that something was up. And eventually, I ended up telling my parents. And I mean, we did what we could, but the, the, the police didn't really, you know, do a whole lot. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, it is hard though, when there is no like real proof, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, that was like a really tiring and exhausting experience, just talking to the police and, yeah. and all of that. And I just wanted it to be over. I was just done with that. I didn't mm-hmm. want to think about it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine you just. It's hard enough for it to happen, and then you got to go talk to the police mm-hmm. and try to deal with it and the stories and everything. That's that's terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I'm sorry I had to go through that. Thank you. Yeah, no, but I think that was like I always try and think like when did my addiction start? Mm-hmm. Like what was like the key thing? Like what made me choose to numb everything? And I mm-hmm. think that's probably what it was for sure. And uh, then it just became 
well, it was an addiction. It was nothing like uh, that was the most important thing in the world to me. Um, and I would get manic episodes where I was like, I can do anything. Nothing's going to hurt me. I'm invincible. I can do all the drugs, drink all the alcohol. Nothing's going to hurt me kind of thing. And it became super dangerous, really dangerous. Yeah. 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 It would. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a dark place to be. Yeah. It's just truly really hard. You don't you don't see a future. Mm-hmm. So it's basically just you know, you're just you don't really care about anything at that point. Like you care about, you know, your drug of choice and that's about it. You don't think about other people. You don't think about your family and how they feel. Um Yeah, you're just so caught up in in using. So it's almost like moment to moment, um, just whatever the next substance is. Mm-hmm. Yep, basically that my whole life revolved around it. Um, but actually, it got to a point. Um, I remember the the day that I decided I needed to get help. It was a it was a Sunday morning, and I had been on a bender, drinking like for weeks, like mm-hmm. weeks, just drinking all day every day. And it was a Sunday morning and I had woken up early and I was like, well, I'm going to gotta go to the liquor store. Um, and then I realized that the liquor store doesn't open till 12 and this was like at 9 a.m. So I would have had to wait a couple hours. Mm-hmm. And I was on the bathroom floor like crying and shaking and so sick and just like a mess because I had to wait three hours yeah. to get some liquor. Wow. Like, it was just... It was insane. And then that's when I first started to get help. Um, and I went to detox, and um, which is just a crazy place to be. Think about a bunch of people withdrawing together all at once. It's yeah. just uh, it's, cra- it's crazy. But um, yeah, it was, it was, I've, yeah, it was interesting. This is an interesting time. But uh, and I was kind of a chronic relapser. Like I would get sober for a month and then I'd relapse, go right back into it. And then I decided I was going to get sober again and get sober for a little bit. And then, and it wasn't until, uh, someone introduced me to, uh, the strength program, which is a youth rehab center in Riverside. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to really commit this time. Uh, and that place was amazing. Like, I think it did, did wonders for me. Um, I didn't get sober right away. Um, I, I know some people who do, they go there and they just find the answer and they get sober and it's amazing. And I, I didn't have that experience that time. Um, I learned so much though about like healthy coping and how, when I get sober, what, how I'm going to do it kind of thing, how I'm going to live a happy, healthy life and without, without drugs and alcohol. Um, and I had, you know, been sober on and off throughout the whole experience. And uh, I did relapse whenever I got out of strength. Um, and that's when I started at the, the Reach, Reach Foundation, the program there, uh, which is an employment program. So, like, their, their main goal is to help you from recovery into a normal life, like mm. with work, whether it's work or school or whatever you're planning on doing, they, mm-hmm. they help you from, because when you're in recovery, you're not, you're not really doing anything, you know, like I, I've had plenty of jobs, but like never really like stable jobs or like when I've gone to school, but I never really stuck with it. And mm-hmm. like, yeah. they teach you just how to do that. Basically just how to live like a normal person after being in recovery and how to, you know, just manage day to day with proper coping skills and not turning back to your old ways. Um, so that was like the, that was a big light bulb for me, I think. Um, and having to be there every day, like you, you go from 834 every day, like if you, like it's a big accountability thing, you know, like Mm -hmm. you you show up and you do your work. Um, and I think it got me on a really good routine too. Yeah. And it just, um, I had something to look forward to every day like I know, I know I'm going to do this whatever yeah. um and that like that helps a lot um and then that's how I got my job with you so yeah that's awesome so that program's called reach yeah and um how do you get into that 
So um, they have a Facebook page that you can uh, look into. They have sort of like you apply basically, yeah. and they'll take the top I think eight or ten uh, people, and uh, you, it's a sixteen week program. So twelve weeks of it is um, in at reach. We do different things. We have a wood shop, so we make like make different things. We have a soap shop. We make soap, which is amazing. So much fun. I mm-hmm. love it. I love yeah. soap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a big gym. Yeah. Uh, we work out every day. It's mm. part of it. Uh, we have a big kitchen. We used to go to Sobeys and meet with a chef, and he would teach us just like like how to cook. Basically, like how to cook yeah. meals and how to make like left like have leftovers for the next day and like how to plan your meals yeah. and stuff, and how to shop. Like they would take us through the store and be like, "This is how you find a sale," and like, you know, wow. yeah, they taught us like just basic life skills that I never really, yeah. If I did learn, I forgot through the yeah. years, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and yeah, and then the gym programs so you're exercising, which is awesome, and. Yeah, so then they help you find a job placement for four weeks, and you go off off on your job placement placement for four weeks, and then hopefully, if you're like me, you get a job, <laughs> or uh, you know maybe you decide that's not for you and you want to pick a different route, yeah. or uh, you get some experience. It looks great on a resume. Um, yeah, so that was like yeah, that was a big deal for me. That was a big life changer. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, it sounds like it would be, and it sounds like, uh, just so many healthy activities mm-hmm. and, and life skills. I think like the average person could probably benefit from some of those life so skills too. too. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's, yeah, that's really awesome. Um, that that's a program. Um, so you said like the top 10, is that like the top 10 applicants? Yeah. So they'll choose basically who they think is ready. Okay. Yeah. So they will they'll have an interview process and mm-hmm. they'll talk to you and you'll you'll kind of tell them a bit of your story and what you plan to do in the future and if they think they can help you they'll they'll take you basically. Yeah. Um because of space and staff they only have I think 8 or 10 uh people each session. Yeah. But uh it's hard to cuz some people will sign up for this thinking like okay great like I'm going to do this but then once they start they have relapsed or something and then they won't continue on so they try and pick people who they think are really ready for a change and really want it like really Mm -hmm. want to do it and it's such an amazing opportunity that that uh like i'm so grateful for it yeah so so grateful yeah no that's awesome that's awesome that you got the job placement and uh yeah now you work there and i get to work with you every day yeah (laughs) (laughs) um so we work with uh we work with kids. Mm-hmm. Um, we won't bother saying where, but mm-hmm. uh, it's an after-school program. Um, has working with kids been beneficial to you? Oh my gosh, yes. Kids are like the best. <laughs> like I could be <laughs> having like the worst day, and then I just show up at work, and some kids like I lost my tooth last night, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> yeah. that is amazing. That's so exciting. The tooth fairy is coming. Like yeah. I, I don't know. It's just something about kids, and they're just so like. They're so honest and just so pure, and I just, yeah. I just love it. Like, uh, I love it so much, and yeah. I, I think I have a lot of like empathy for them too, and yeah. a lot of like compassion. Yeah. And I know that not all of them have the best home lives, mm-hmm. so to be able to, to give them that safe space to be for a few hours after mm-hmm. school, and and yeah. and, uh, you know, help them if if I can, then that's really important to me. I think, and and it's important to start young too, mm-hmm. um, caring for kids when they're young and after school is always a iffy time for kids so yeah, it's nice sure. that they have a good positive safe place to be and not uh yeah not go down the wrong path so yeah <laughs> well no you're definitely uh you're definitely good um good at your job and good at relating to them um and being empathetic um whenever one of them's having a rough time or whatever um they always want to talk to you, so <laughs> that warms my heart. Yeah, so much. like that makes me so happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So I mean, that's awesome that you can bring that to the table and they feel comfortable around you. Yeah. Um. So, was the strength program that's um a rehab yeah. kind of place? Yeah. Was that the only one you went to? Yeah. Yeah. 
that was the only place I, I mean, I, I had done some programs through detox, um, but they were usually like three week programs kind of thing. It just wasn't enough. Yeah. Um, but I ended up being at strength for six months straight, full six months. It's usually two to three months, right. but I just stayed. <laughs> right. I stayed until I thought I was ready. And, yeah. uh, yeah, like you learn so much. Uh, we have a program, it's DBT, it's dialectic yeah. behavioral therapy. I hope I said that right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but right. it's, uh, it's basically just like teaches you like coping skills, mindfulness, um, just different things like that, that really helped a lot, I think. And I use it day to day without even really realizing it, mm-hmm. but I use those skills like every day. Um, and then we have like, we have like living recovery and, and different, like, it's almost like a classroom setup kind of thing. Like you'd have a schedule for the day of like what classes you have. Um, and then in the evenings we do, you know, go to the pool, go to the gym, do stuff like that. So it was, it's, it's a really great program and I suggest it to a lot of people. Um, it's, it's really good. It is a live in like rehab center. So you, you, you live there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's 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 great. I can't say enough good things about it. So the uh, that kind of like strict schedule is that something you think that helped you at the time? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I needed that for sure. Um, I had no sort of schedule or routine or even a sleep schedule. Like I had nothing like that. Right. Nothing. And then to go somewhere where everything's kind of set up for you. Like, okay, you get up at this time and then we're going to do these classes and then we're going to go work out somewhere and then you have to be in bed at a certain hour and and stuff like that was, I mean, just like mental health wise completely made made me feel so much better Mm -hmm. because I was sleeping properly and I was eating properly and and just like basic things like that that you don't do Mm -hmm. when you're in active addiction. Mm -hmm. Um, just yeah those simple things and just being able to talk about everything openly and not have to worry about anyone judging you because they're all in the same place right Mm -hmm. um and the staff they're amazing amazing um they they're just super understanding a lot of them are recovering addicts too which i find very helpful so relatable Mm -hmm. to them and uh yeah so it makes it a lot easier to to be able to share things with someone who understands what you're going through Mm -hmm. yeah and isn't going to judge you yeah yeah imagine it's kind of hard to to share or feel like they understand if they've never been through addictions yeah if you're talking specifically about that Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's not really something you can just explain to a person and they'll understand it's not something you can read in a book yeah you know it's something that like if you have lived experience uh you're probably gonna understand more and be able to help more right yeah yeah so, um, is there, as of now, um, is there things you do on a daily basis, like, uh, like a lot of the things you, you talked about, um, to kind of maintain your mental health and, and everything? Yeah. So, um, I am properly medicated, which helps a lot. Um, I have seen lots of doctors, lots of psychiatrists throughout the years, and uh, I found one that um, I think he really understood me, understood what I was going through, and got me on a good um, cocktail of medication, I guess you could say, that uh, works really well for me, and uh, so that's like that's a, a big part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I see, I see an addictions counselor at Mount Herbert. Um, and we just, we talk, (laughs) we just talk about, um, you know, different triggers and struggles that I might be facing and, and, uh, ways to keep me sober basically. And I also see a mental health therapist, um, and she's amazing. I love her so much. Um, and we just, yeah, like in on more healthy coping skills and how to live my life without, you know, those negative coping mechanisms. That would be so helpful, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So helpful. Just, Ther- therapy is the best. Yeah. yeah, it really is. I mean, it's it's the fact that you get to talk to someone who's not a part of something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, she's 
so unbiased Mm -hmm. and you can just be like this is how i feel about everything and Mm -hmm. then they can help you specifically you know like i mean i like i talk to my family and stuff about everything all the time but it's different because they're part of it you know what Mm -hmm. i mean they're in it somehow yeah whereas she's just she's just there to help me yeah that's the only reason they're there yeah yeah Yeah. no it's so beneficial i think yeah definitely um medication is it antidepressants yeah so i'm on a antidepressant um i take anxiety medication and i take a mood stabilizer for my bipolar Mm -hmm. so um which is really important i never really was on a proper mood stabilizer and i think that's what made a really big difference okay my doctor was like i don't know why you haven't been on this before but you should have been for a long time and now that i'm on it it's amazing like i feel oh yeah yeah like i don't get like crazy manic or like crazy depressed anymore i'm like so much more level which is super helpful and then i take uh i have some sleeping medication too um to help me sleep because i have uh i used to have really bad nightmares and stuff yeah. Um, nightmares to like flashbacks and stuff. Right. Um, so I take medication for that. And uh, I also saw this is on some really cool side note. I saw a psychologist at, when I was in year nine. Yeah. And she helped me with my nightmares. Like, specifically, she did like dream therapy with me, which I think is the coolest thing in the world. She really, yeah, she literally so got rid of my nightmares. Like, I, I don't know. I, I still don't even really, it's almost like hypnosis. Kind of thing, like, it's, like, you know, you get really relaxed and you're kind of, like, not really with it and she'll, like, talk to you and she basically goes through, because my my nightmares were, like, reoccurring nightmares, so I'd have the same thing every night, Mm -hmm. Um, and she would just kind of, like, go through my dream but kind of make it not scary, like, make it not a nightmare and just change the ending to something positive And, and then eventually that's when I started dreaming was, like, the happy version, like wow. the good version. I don't. I still don't understand how it works, but I think it's yeah. just the coolest thing. That and, is cool, and it like changed my life because when you can't sleep, man, that can throw off your whole, your whole mood, everything. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, um, yeah. I experienced that for a while. Nightmares. And, uh, not nightmare. Not necessarily. Well, nightmares. Um, some, but just not being able to sleep in general, mm-hmm. and. uh yeah, you're not even the same. If you're up for a day or two, you're not the same person. No, you so aren't. It's, no. it's kind of crazy, actually. It is, How yeah. You feel? Sleep you is sleep. so important. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how often uh, are you seeing, you see the addictions counselor and uh, mental health therapist? Yeah, so I see them every two weeks. So it kind of, might be one, one week and, okay. and the other, ne- the next. Right. Um, and then my like my psychiatrist, I only see him every couple of months because he just does some medication. So, yeah. Cool. Um, is there anything else, um, just kind of like on a daily basis that um, you find helps your mental health and gets you on the right path? Yeah, just um, it sounds so simple, but just getting out of bed every day and yeah. doing something. Yeah. Like. Find something that you like to do and do it every day, mm-hmm. and it'll it'll help so much. And it's mm-hmm. it sounds so basic, but but it really isn't when you're struggling. Mm-hmm. You know, just getting up and doing something. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, and just like like I said, kids are a big thing for me. So I love yeah. kids, and I'm always surrounded by kids. My mom babysits kids. My nieces and nephews are always around and and they're like my main reason for getting up every day so Mm -hmm. um but yeah like just i like i know some people who really like art so they'll they'll be like okay i'm gonna get up at this time to and start a painting whatever it might be whatever your thing is Mm -hmm. um just find it and then do it and keep doing it and eventually it'll just become habit and that's just your normal normal life now Mm -hmm. you you don't have you don't struggle as much and i mean i still have bad days i'm not gonna lie i still have bad days all the time it happens um but you you learn how to deal with it in a healthy way Mm -hmm. um because you don't want one bad day to kind of like ruin everything you know what i mean like you've you've come so far you don't want to ruin your progress kind of thing yeah bad days are gonna happen yeah but um just know that not every day has to be a bad day yeah 
do. Do you find that kind of comes with experience too, that like when you have a bad day, you know that like, you know, tomorrow probably won't be or yeah, for sure. these things then? Yeah, it took a while because I had so many bad days that I thought that it was only bad days. Yeah. But the more that I have good days, I realize that, you know, bad days are just, it's just a day. Right. It's going to go away and you're going to feel better and don't, you know, wallow in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we've, we talked about this a little bit before, um, but, um, as far as addictions, I, uh, I have someone in my family who's, um, dealt with it too, Mm -hmm. um, pretty severely. And, uh, we just kind of talked about how, um, it can be really hard from the, the family perspective or the people around, um, around them. Yeah. So, um, would you give any advice to the family around someone dealing with addiction and or the person so yes so for the person it's one of those things that you want you have to really want it Mm -hmm. you have to want to get better yeah um if you just keep thinking oh you know like this is going to be the rest of my life whatever you're not going to get any better yeah um and as for the families i know it's so hard because i i listen to my family talk about um stuff like when I was in active addiction and how hard it was on them and it's also hard being the addict because you don't see that that's you don't see that until after it's kind of like something that you don't really you just don't think about it like you're you're too caught up in other stuff that you don't really think about like how other people are feeling um and the only thing that I can suggest is just is to encourage them as much as you can and just keep encouraged like don't give up on them Mm -hmm. don't give up just know that if they want to get better they will and just keep offering them the help and if you keep offering it hopefully someday they'll take it um and like there's so many different resources on pei um look into them look into it um i know there's different even like support groups for parents of people with addicts of, uh, of addicts and, uh, like, I know my parents went to, like, some sort of group thing where they just talk about what you can do to help your kid, basically. Um, it's, yeah, it's hard. Um, it's one of those things that, like, it's a very personal decision to get clean. So it's really hard for anyone else to, you know, say you need to get clean. Like, yeah, but you need to want it. And I think that was a a big thing for me, especially was like with relapsing so often was that I would get clean for other people, you know, like, you know, my parents would want me to get clean, so I'd get clean and then I'd always end up relapsing. It wasn't until I decided that like, I am sick and tired of feeling like this and I am ready to, to make a change. That's when I finally actually got sober and was in kind of a sober mindset and not just you know counting the days that I haven't used drugs mm-hmm. you know like it's it's really weird and it's really personal um but I think if you just keep offering the help and if you just keep encouraging them and tell them you know like how important they are to you and that you believe in them and which is a big thing because you don't you don't think that anyone really cares um, so just keep reminding them that you care and that you want them to get better and hopefully someday they will. That's awesome. That's yeah. really, it's really good advice and, um, a lot of insightful, insightfulness there. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for having me. Can I just say that I think this is amazing? Like, I think this is awesome. Like, literally since the day that you told me about it, I was like, yes, like, rooting for you. Thank you so much. I just, uh, I hope it can help some people. I think it definitely will. And I think, I just think that it's amazing. I think you're the perfect person to do it, too. Um, I think you understand. Like, you just have that, like, understanding. Uh, You're not judging anyone. You just want to hear their their story and hear, you know, how, how people can help. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Thanks, man. <laughs>